All right, welcome everybody. This is a brand new year for the OWASP Nashville chapter. My name is Ross Young and, and I'll be here today with each of you. And we have a special guest speaker. We have Miss uh, Michelle Chubirka, and she is going to talk to us about containers. And she has a fantastic background. She was a cloud security architect at Bank of America. She did uh, security architecture work as well, leading a lot of the Kubernetes and cloud security at Capital One. And uh, Michelle, you can tell us a little bit about what you're doing now, and, and we'd love to hear about your container security presentation. Great. Um, nice to see you again, Ross. I'm always happy to work with you, uh, whether or not we are at the same company or somewhere else. Uh, Hi, my name is Michelle Ch Chiburka, and I'm a chief security architect at um, Success Factors SAP. It's uh, the HXM wing of SAP. Uh, and today's talk is container security. It's all about the supply chain. So uh, again, some more background about me, um, chief security architect, professional contrarian, as, like, as Ross well knows. Um, I've, I've been the creator of the Healthy Paranoia Security Podcast. I have a video called Security Sock Puppets. I've been an analyst, a researcher, a blogger, B2B writer. You can still find my writing on uh, Tech Target and also uh, Dark Reading occasionally and uh, Information Week. Um, you can reach out to me at this email address or on my blog site, postmodernsecurity.com. So just, I was going to do a poll, <laughs> maybe I can get an idea of where your organization, where people's organizations are using containers, um, just getting started, evenly split between containers and full VMs, or what's a container? Um, Ross, what, like, where is, uh, where you are now, where, where are they with containerization? It, it largely depends on the division, right? We have, in my org, it's mostly commercial technologies. So we use a lot of SaaS and there's not much containers, but there is a couple projects. And then there are other in-house projects where they are heavily container in, in, in other divisions. Um, Linda, are you, is your organization using containers a lot yet? We're, I'm going to say it's kind of split, but yeah, we, we do use containers heavily and um, we, we've got several different um, teams based off of the products that they work. So every team kind of does their own thing, what works best for them. And Scott, do you, are you allowed to share where you are? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, I can talk about where I'm at, where I was. So, um, yeah, so I'm like, now I'm at a manufacturer, but I used to be at a bank and I, I've seen people just adopt containers, mostly based on the team structure, right? What knowledge they bring in or what the, right. you know, like center of excellence is companies in part. So I see a lot more when people are trying to go cloud native, um, doing that. And then it's on various, you know, orchestration stacks. So uh, it's, it's always a, a different, interesting journey. I, I would say that a lot of the like platform as a service or right. other types of things tend not to do that. Um, and then that just comes down to like an org's decision, whether they're going to, they're going to build software, right. Or buy it. And okay. I'm also not seeing a lot of it in some of the integration where you maybe get a SaaS vendor and then you're using a lot of low code, right? Um, yeah. Just because there's paths that's out there. So largely I see in containers where in certain spots where there's languages um, being rolled out, so. Cool, okay, that yeah. gives me an idea. You're, it's not completely container, not knowledgeable at all. Um, right. So I like to approach containers as a process. Um, as a software supply chain, because that's what I see. In a lot of ways, I think uh, container adoption is a political response to of developers saying uh, they don't want to wait for infrastructure, slow infrastructure people anymore. And so it really is 
uh, part of their development process. Um, you probably then, none of you probably need to know this, but at least I'll just touch on it because there might be some people who watch the recording who aren't familiar with the software supply chain. Just, it's a set of processes that build a product. And I just am covering, you know, the common tools that you might see in that space. I'm sure that everybody here knows exactly what that is. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. Um, I mean, I broke out, uh, typically this is the container supply chain, which is really almost two, it's almost two pipelines because you're building the software and then you're packaging it up. And then you put, you might put that package um, actually inside a container to run. Depending on what you're using, if you're using um, from scratch distroless, or if you're using a base image, this is typically what you're going to get, which is um, sort of a, <laughs> these weird pipelines of pipelines, right? Until you get to the point where you're, you actually have the container pipeline and you create this um, image that's put into a container repository. Um, a I just thought I'd you. highlight some of the typical software supply chain risks that are out there. This is from uh, the NIST Defending Against Software Supply Chain Attacks. Really good document, I recommend it. Um, talks about, uh, it gives some good examples of actual supply chain attacks at different um, parts of the life cycle. Uh, for example, design, development, production, and you know all the stuff we've heard before. For example, uh, there's solar winds, which is you know the the gift that keeps on giving, right? Um, until log four J, right? And uh, you know end user uh, device malware. There was the issue with Kaspersky antivirus, where it was banned from from the U.S. government. But I think everybody's heard about some of these. Um, and I'll certainly share the slides uh, later in case you want to take advantage of using some of it for FUD in your organization when you're doing presentations. Feel free to, to steal. I, you know, I just took these from uh, NIST documentation. Um, but I think we understand that the supply chain, you know, especially with Log4j and, and the uh, hypocrite uh, commits that happened with Linux in the last year, that that's probably the area of concern to everyone because material enters our ecosystems that we're not sure of, right? Um, again, here's another example, uh, the uh, Trojan source where um, uh, we had uh, the bi-directional uh, algorithm attack where you can uh, put in control characters and it reorders uh, comments in source code so that you can actually do an injection attack. I think that did not get the attention that it deserved, unlike log4j, but I think it's an actually, it's a, it's a far more dangerous attack. Um, Scott, I noticed you have your hand up. You look like you wanna say something. Yeah, I was gonna, I had a question back on slide a couple back, right? Yeah, sure. And this one or this you, one? Or wait. <laughs> that one right here. Yep. Yeah. So, so like in the supply chain, right? Mm -hmm. you, you probably have two different places, right? Your golden images, which I like the color on your platform side. And then you have <laughs> them also within your actual code, right? Right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's why it gets so complicated because you have multiple places and you actually sometimes the tools themselves, the security tools themselves cause the problem because you get different findings. But we'll talk mm -hmm. some more about that um, okay. as I get to closer to the actual creation of the image. Um, I also wanna talk about uh, if people are not aware of this, uh, the Salsa project is, I'm hoping that people have heard of that before. Um, it's a project that came out of Google um, and it's a, a supply chain, uh, you know, it's a way of looking at, at the supply chain to identify um, attacks via attack surface. It's really great. And it's how you identify, uh, you break down supply chain threats. And, you know, if we walk it from left to right, you'll look at 
Um, you know, you can bypass code review, B is a uh, compromised uh, source control system, your repo. Um, you can have modified code after source control. Uh, you can have a compromised build platform like Jenkins. You could have a bad dependency. You can bypass CI CD altogether. I have seen that. Um, you can have compromised package repos where you might have the container. Um, you could also have somebody pull like some rogue package from somewhere because you're not really uh, forcing people to use, you know, the standard central a standard centralized platform tool. But I I recommend this. This is uh, there's some really great work coming out on supply chain right now, also from the CNCF um, and the Linux Foundation, which has a new um, some open source initiatives and supply chain. So, but I have all of that in the references of this deck. Um, we went over that. So um, what is supply chain security? Uh, it's about adding assurance to the software development process, right? Uh, creating confidence and trust in the source material and the practices used. Um, it's sort of a holistic view for protecting each stage in the software development life cycle and approaching the SDLC as a set of business processes. Um, and you want to validate that the final product meets a reasonable set of security criteria to ensure it isn't vulnerable. And then although this isn't new, we, there have been recent high chain, uh, high impact attacks, uh, solar winds, log4j, I'm going to say that at least probably five more times, um, that have heightened the attention on software supply chains um, by governments and large private sector organizations. Okay, now we'll get to the good part. What is a container, right? I like to think of a container as a bunch of software ingredients. Um, this is from the Docker site itself, um, the definition of a container. And it's a standard unit of software that packages up code, right? That's really, people, you know, they make, they get really confused about it and they overcomplicate containers when in reality, it's just another technique for packaging up software. Um, but it's just a little more convenient because you have all the dependencies together, right? And so you can, you can it makes it more portable and reliable to move around. Um, it's a lightweight standalone executable package of software that has everything that it needs to run. Um, I love this diagram. I stole this a while ago and there's the reference for it. Uh, it gives you an idea of comparison of, of virtual machines versus containerization. Um, even though it doesn't happen as often, I still see people get confused a lot about the differences between the two and you get people who try to secure containers the way you secure virtual machines, and they misunderstand the attack surface difference between the two. I think the most critical thing to understand is that with a virtual machine, you've got your own kernel with, you know, so every guest operating system, you know, every application that you're hosting on that virtual machine, it's got a dedicated kernel, right? But that's not the case on a container host, right? Or even a, a node, a Kubernetes node. You have a shared kernel. Um, that infinitely increases the risk that you're dealing with um, with regards to containers. Um, and we're gonna talk about the container runtimes a little bit. I get really nitpicky about the way people talk about runtimes. We need to remember that a runtime is responsible for running the container and any uh, other tasks that are used for um, downloading or unpacking the image. And you'll see that, by the way, I called out different uh, container runtimes here, and it's a mix of a high level and low level co um, container runtimes, but Cryo, Run C, Gvisor, Kata. Um, let me make sure. Yeah, I like that slide there, there, Michelle, uh, with the different ones. I used to always call it the guest OS tax, because if you're running, <laughs> let's say, Windows, and you're paying two gigs of memory for every virtual yeah. machine, you know, three, 
three machines and, and you really feel that on any laptop, right? So, well, but sometimes taxes are good. I know you don't want to hear that, but um, so this is, and this is where that gets important, right? User space versus uh, kernel space. Um, so yes, there's a tax, right? Virtual machines, but virtual machines run their own isolated kernels. There's no shared memory, no shared execution space between the guests. And what does that really mean? The second you start having to share kernels, danger will Robinson, right? That's where it gets sketchy. Um, because without the addition of virtual machine technology, um, you have Kata containers, Firecracker, Gvisor, um, that adds on like a, um, a, a, a VM uh, technology to a container, which makes it kind of a hybrid. For example, if you're familiar with Lambda, with AWS Lambda, that's actually using something called Firecracker and there's virtual machine technology in there to add a little more isolation, right? Um, you're not, you'll hear a lot of times that people say containers are an isolation technology. It's a segmentation technology. It is ex not an isolation technology. You do have techniques like Linux namespaces, capabilities, SecComp, SC Linux, AppArmor, and C groups. You can enhance that segmentation or segregation between running container instances, but it you're still sharing a kernel, right? Um, this is a diagram that I have to sort of help illustrate what a container file system looks like, right? It's a file system bundle. It's built of layers that correspond to instructions in, in a Docker file. Um, this becomes important as you move through this. I wanna make sure I didn't skip through some of these definitions. <clears throat> By the way, um, I did put this in here. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the concept called lazy pulling. Normally what happens that you sort of, you have this uh, bundle and it has everything once the container is in instantiated, but with lazy pulling, it's a newer technique where you can actually pull on demand when you actually need it. Um, and it means that the container can start faster. Um, I have not explored the possible attack surface with this yet. Uh, it does make me a little nervous because I don't know if it's, it just increases the potential for a supply chain attack, um, but I haven't seen any attacks yet, but you should be aware of it. Yeah, it seems like um, it has the potential okay, for malware on demand instead of like being able to scan and know if you had it in your image. <laughs> I yeah, I I haven't really played around to see if I could uh, break it myself, but because I just found out about it, it's it's a brand new technique. It doesn't even it's not even fully supported with everything, but um, I don't and I don't even know what that does to the to the security tools. I, I know that the checksum doesn't change but it still makes me nervous. Maybe just because I haven't played with it enough myself. Um, I, I think it's important to understand the different uh, run times and the difference between a runtime and container management. If you want to make me go completely insane, you will start, <laughs> you will call Docker, you will use Docker as like, the required tool for containers, right? Um, which just makes me flip out, right? Uh, it, it's not, right? Docker uh, was at one time, you know, it's just a wrapper around uh, LXC, right? It just makes it easier to use, but they donated container D. Um, it's now open source. But so what you hear about Docker now is really uh, anymore, it's a high level container management tool. In fact, Kubernetes, they removed uh, Docker from Kubernetes and now it's just uh, generic um, container D. So you have to actually add it back, I think, if you wanna have the whole fat uh, Docker uh, package. But you'll see um, it's, 
you know, I've, I've walked it out here where you have a high level container runtime like Podman, by the way, that's a tool to build containers on Red Hat in case you aren't familiar with that. Um, and it's a, it, it, all it is, is you're talking about container runtime interfaces, right? Now, when you start dealing uh, at the Kubernetes level. And I think pretty much we're all, um, unless you're running a managed on a managed service like AWS um, ECS or something like that, pretty much everybody's using uh, Kubernetes to run containers. Um, although, fun fact, uh, Azure um, is using Service Fabric if you're using their container, uh, their hosted container service now. They, it's a combination actually of their Fabric service and Kubernetes, FYI, in case you didn't know that. Um, again, as you walk right, uh, high level container runtime, Docker, container D, libpod, and then um, the open container interface, and you get uh, run C, Kata runtime, Gvisor. Uh, Gvisor is uh, Google and it has some sandboxing technology. Kata is um, IBM's and it has, um, is it? No, I'm thinking Nabla, sorry unfortunate name, Nabla containers, um, but it's a heavier container with some sandboxing technology, right? Yeah, I, I recognize that was a lot of knowledge acquisition. I'm happy to share the slides. It's more a reference. I created that for myself because it gets very confusing and it's complicated and I'm happy to share it with you and sort of it was a way for me to sort of make sure that everybody was familiar and on the same page with uh, container technologies. So container mistakes, I should have just called this slide Michelle's pet peeves about containers. <laughs> when um, containers are not equal to full virtual machines or an AMI, a lot of people here have said that they're using, um, you know, that their containerization might be um, it, it varies depending on whether or not they're using a SaaS application. Uh, be prepared. I don't know if you realize this, but um, everybody now, all vendors, if you're running anything on premise or yourself, they're giving it to you in a container. Especially, uh, my favorite is, um, uh, you know, data science applications. They love handing you containers, and they're usually bad containers. Uh, when I worked in uh, Bank of America, we used to get vendor containers that were the worst I have ever seen and try and get those remediated. It's almost more dangerous, the stuff that you get from vendors. <laughs> um, and it's horrifying because as I've written here, uh, they're very bloated. Um, you should avoid, and unfortunately, this is what uh, a lot of uh, commercial vendors will do, you should avoid trying to put an entire monolithic application stack in a container. Unfortunately, what I've seen is that uh, new people coming to containerization, new developers or development teams, when they're trying to decompose a monolith into microservices, what they'll frequently do is early on is they'll try and shove the monolith into a container as they're starting to experiment. Not a great idea because it increases your attack surface and it's not you know, a tight, clean image that you want. Um, the, another pet peeve of mine, you want to differentiate in your mind because it's, it's definitively separate in the supply chain and you have different kinds of controls that you're going to employ, but the running instance is not equal to the image, right? You have an image and you have the instance. And where this really gets important is if you have separate tools that do different parts. Like you may have one tool, like maybe an open source tool, um, like uh, maybe Anchor, and that's doing your image, but it's not doing the runtime, right? So then you get into a difficulty of trying to stitch the run, the running instance and the image together so that you can effectively track remediation, right? Um, it, it gets complicated uh, and it's not always easy to, to put the two together, but you need to understand that they're different, 
especially when you're talking to developers, because you're going to want them to remediate problems in the image when they're building it. You don't want them to try to interact with a running instance and patch it, right? That's a terrible idea. Um, again, container is just a software package, uh, including its dependencies and libraries. So where do you get your containers from? Uh, you can pull a base image from a public or private registry. Uh, you can, uh, it's very common for developers to pull a base image from Docker Hub. You need to be very cautious of that. Uh, I do not recommend letting development teams pull in a base image from Docker Hub without it being quarantined first. I think that's a mistake. Uh, I understand they wanna work at velocity, but you should try to give them tools that will allow them to, uh, to validate that image before they start using it. Uh, you hear all the time of people pulling images from Docker Hub that have been uh, compromised with um, you know, Bitcoin miners or whatever. It's because you can't necessarily trust it. Um, you can also, uh, so you can use those images you know, from a reg an external registry, right? You can create, you can use a multi-stage build, um, selectively copying what you need and then forking or creating your own image. Um, without using one of those base images, you can build a complete image yourself. You can, can build your own container completely yourself using something like Build-It. Not many people do it because it's a pain in the butt and it's, it's slow, right? Um, banking will tend to do something like that, right? Or high, uh, you know, high uh, secure environments. Um, you can also, uh, something I really love is creating a single layer image from called from scratch. Um, and it's using a statically compiled binary. That is my favorite kind of image. It's a, 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 but be aware that your security tools, your container security tools will fail because there is nothing there. A, a from scratch image is a no-op. It doesn't mean anything. So a container security tool will hit it and go, eh, I don't get it. <laughs> you can also make a, a distro list image um, that includes an app, the application and the, only the runtime dependencies. Um, I, I don't think, some container security tools don't like that either. So you wanna use the best ingredients. If you do, uh, go get, if you want to use base images, if that's the technique you want to use, then you want a trusted source for base images. Uh, you want to validate the image with a container security tool and or a software composition analysis tool. I'm not a big, this isn't about, I don't have like, you know, favorite tools. I'm not going to talk about like, you know, use this tool over that tool. But what I am going to warn you about is um, there are, uh, software composition analysis tools that purport to uh, be a container security tool. What sometimes what that means is they understand the format of a container, you know, that layered file system, but they don't actually do anything to check for hardening or, um, you know, the security of the way you created the container itself. They'll only look at you know, the, uh, any vulnerabilities in the components. So you need to understand that you may have to likely layer those tools. And also, um, you know, an S a standard FCA tool isn't a runtime tool, right? So it's not gonna look at some of the things like running as privileged and stuff like that. Um, you wanna economize, you wanna only add elements that are really necessary for the microservice and you wanna have one service per container, right? Um, you want to follow that concept of least privilege. You don't want to run root processes. You don't want to run the containers privileged. Um, you want to limit syscalls. Um, you want to try to parameterize, right? You don't want to hard code configs or embed credentials and secrets in the image. You want to parameterize those and get them in a just-in-time way from a, vault, a vaulting technology uh, either um, AWS has a uh, secrets manager or you have like vault, for example, um, a container should be immutable. That is the core tenet of uh, cloud native technologies, right? Uh, 
You want ephemerality and immutability. So if you, if you have a problem, if you need to troubleshoot it, you want to reinstantiate. There are techniques in Kubernetes for doing debug where it allows you to, it basically replicates the troubleshooting of the, you know, the environment that's having a problem. It replicates it, it duplicates it so that you can interact with that environment, tear it down when you stop using it, and then re it allows you to figure it out so that you can reinstantiate you know, the production container instance. Um, you want to minimize, you want to use techniques like distroless and from scratch and eliminate unnecessary elements or layers, right? You don't want shells, you don't want unnecessary demons, you don't want to have things like, uh, you know, wget on a container, right? Um, and then you want to automate a container. If you're not building your containers using uh, an automated pipeline, if you're uh, interacting with Kubernetes and you're not using Git ops or something like that, you're really not taking advantage of the technologies in the way that it can, um, you know, uh, create an environment of least privilege and separation of duties. So what do I mean here? Uh, fry, bake, buy. Fry is sort of that idea of um, uh, baking uh, versus bootstrapping with uh, virtual machines, right? Uh, similar to that, so you have frying, which is a custom built or um, extended third party image. Um, it's deployed, but changed during a bootstrapping activity, right? Um, you have uh, baking, which is a custom built or extended third party image, uh, fully created with all the dependencies as part of a su supply chain, but it's a tested and immutable. Um, buying is just you're getting a third party or a vendor image and it's deployed without changes, but it can still be attested and to and and you know identified as immutable. So the point I'm trying to make with this is that you want to uh, bake or buy, but never fry. And some common things that you used to see a couple of years ago, and sometimes you'll still see it, is that an image will. Uh, instantiate and part of instantiation in the runtime is it goes out and does a W get. That's the worst idea ever. You really never want to see that because you can't trust that. Now you don't have an attested image, right? Um, so let's talk about uh, the container valid security validation uh, elements, right? Here's a typical uh, validation uh, process where, you know, at 1A, I have third party images that are downloaded or mirrored from a public repository to an internal repository that can be used as a base image or used as is. Um, but then you might, like, if you're going to use that as a base image, then you'll fork it um, with a custom layer. Uh, or you can completely custom build your, your own image, right? But regardless, you take it to uh, a security validation process with you know, a policy engine of some kind that's going to check for vulnerabilities and hardening. Um, it's going to validate it during uh, at multiple phases. You're going to validate it after creation during upload to an internal registry. Um, you can do a daily scheduled scan of, it, of the internal registry. And during CICD, you're going to do a, a fast path where you go, hey, has this, do we identify this? Do we know this image? Okay, we know it, it passed a scan, it passed our criteria for a validated, you know, approved image, it can pass. Oh, wait a second. You know, otherwise you can say during CICD, wait a second, I haven't seen that image before. Slow path it. Now I'm going to scan it and I'm going to make sure it passes my criteria. And the criteria for passing are things like, uh, you know, your CVSS score. Does it meet, um, does it pass the licensing requirements? Um, do does it have any root owned processes in that container image? Um, I don't want it to run as privileged. Just an FYI, uh, when container security tools first came out, 
they had to mount the image to check a lot of this. Now, a lot of them will use Scopio like technologies that allow it to not be mounted, which makes for faster um, scanning in case you have you wait until CICD. I don't recommend that. Um, I th personally think it should be scanned upon commit, checksummed, um, and then you should have daily or weekly scans, whatever you can tolerate depending on scale. And then you just, in CICD, you want to um, just validate that the checksum is the same and that it's, it's past your muster for that. Um, then you know, your container is deployed to a runtime environment and you have a runtime tool that's validating that these have you know, anything that hits admission prior to runtime has been security validated that the image is signed and then it passes uh, to run. Um, what is, when I'm talking about a container orchestrator, you've heard me mention Kubernetes. Kubernetes is probably the most well-known container orchestrator out there. So what does an orchestrator do? Uh, an orchestrator handles deployment and runtime lifecycle of running instances. Uh, it scales instances up and down to meet demand. Um, it helps with redundancy, availability options. Uh, it can uh, help provide a network stack uh, and routing and also with the at with the container network through the container network interface. You can add tools like uh, Cilium. Um, you can have VXLAN or you can have routing. You can do BGP. Um, it offers load balancing, uh, service discovery, health monitoring of container hosts and instances, allows you to create virtual clusters through namespaces. However, there is a whole thing now about whether or not that is really a virtual cluster. <laughs> and now that it gets, it's getting much more complicated in terms of um, adding virtual clusters to your cluster don't even get me started, it's very complicated. Um, it can provide you with some multi-tenant segregation, again, through network segmentation and resource restrictions. Um, other than Kubernetes, you have OpenShift, which is a Red Hat implementation of Kubernetes, essentially, uh, with some little, some extras. Uh, banks love OpenShift, FYI. Uh, you have Mesos and also Nomad, which is an older, previous technology. Uh, you also have cloud provider managed orchestrators like EKS, uh, GKE, and AKS. Um, you also have this wonderful ability to uh, use policies uh, with an entry point that ensures only instances that pass are allowed to run uh, through something called uh, the use of an admission controller. Um, orchestrators provide the last gate for a container prior to runtime. Um, with Kubernetes particularly, uh, you have some wonderful policy mechanisms, i.e. admission control that can validate and enforce attestation of the image. So um, I had a poll <laughs> and there aren't that many people here, but um, I'm wondering if uh, people wanna just let me know, are they using Kubernetes, uh, self-managed Kubernetes, OpenShift? Maybe some of you might be using an older technology like Nomad or Mesos, or maybe even still Docker Swarm. That was one of the originals out there, like the beta VHS discussion, uh, Kubernetes One. Um, I'll just give everybody a minute if you want to chime in and tell me what you're using. Maybe. Yeah, we're using um, we're using Azure uh, Container Apps and Azure Container Instances. Cool. How are you? Uh, is that? Do you find that to be offer less complexity than self managing Kubernetes? Um, we haven't actually gotten in, gotten into self managing Kubernetes. Everybody tells us that it's um, way less effort. We're kind of just still getting used to. Um, deploying containers. One of the ones that we deployed recently was for like a geocoder app. And with all the dependencies we had to install, it ended up hitting 16 gigs. We ended up just having to go to a scale set anyway, but we're getting more and more into containers and still, I would say that we're beginners uh, by far. Okay. Anybody else want to talk about what they're using for running containers in terms of an orchestrator? 
Um, we use Rancher, AKS, and then also, you know, whatever that container solution is in, in AWS. Okay. Uh, managed by a different group, but yeah, at the, at the base, it's, you know, all, uh, all um, builds into Artifactory. Um, okay. So that we can create some kind of, uh, I'll call it a choke point for your binaries. All right. Right. And that's the way I kind of try to tackle security is just, you know, try to uh, funnel cats. <laughs> that's That makes it difficult when you have a hybrid environment like that, where you yeah. have some people doing, personally, I I have a very strong opinion about this. I feel like if you're in cloud, then be in cloud and trying to manage Kubernetes, like trying to self-manage Kubernetes in cloud is so overly complex to manage. Either oh, yeah. do Kubernetes uh, on premise if you have to, or right. use use a managed offering because uh, you think. Like, I remember when I started Unix, I worked with a guy who who said when he started, he worked for this guy who would say, sometimes Unix is a mountain, and some sometimes Unix is a hill, and sometimes it's a mountain, and that's sort of how Kubernetes is. You, you're sort of lulled into uh, complacency with Kubernetes. Oh, it's not that hard. Look, it's, and then you have, you start to try to deal with like, um, you know, uh, load balancing and, and steering workloads and, well, yeah, it's, to, it's, you know, um, it's, segregate. And then it starts to make you nuts, especially. Yeah, with, it's, <laughs> it's the same, you know, it's the same thing. Like process is really hard to build in companies and see uniform layer consistency, right? right? Right. There's lots of shiny tools. People tend to tool first, process second. <laughs> um, but, you know, that, that depends on your company's culture and things like that. I think in the financials, the process comes a little easier just because mm. of the risk partnership. But in retail manufacturing, it's like, ooh, shiny. What? That's new. That's it's it's different. It's it's much different. And you're like, no, it's really not that much different, and probably not as as good. So it's hard to to do that. But um, right. Yeah, it's it's hard. Like, it's what I mean by funnel cats, right? Yeah. Um, because you yeah. can take any aspect of security, whether it be containers or a WAF or crypto. And, and apply the same hardship problem and opportunities to it. Great. Well, thanks everybody for that. That's yeah. it's always interesting <laughs> to talk to other people about, you know, you think that your, your level of hell is unique. And then you realize when you talk to people, it's not just you. Um, yeah. Oh no. <laughs> so, uh, I thought I'd share this. Um, the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, has some great documentation. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you explore um, the GitHub repos uh, for all their principles and documents that they have for best practices. And they have this really great um, supply chain security document. And they talk about the principles, the key principles. I just honestly stole these directly from there because I, I off and on I'll, I'll contribute to the CNCF SIG security group, not heavily. I mean, I'm kind of a lurker, but um, I recommend the work that they do. It's, it's really helpful. Um, they basically talk about the principles of uh, establishing and verifying trust, you know, through using crypto validation, right? Um, using automation because that's how you really create uh, least privilege and separation of duties. It means that you, uh, it makes the audit trail easy. You, you always know what has happened and it makes it easier to identify anything that's anomalous or where something's gone wrong. Um, it, to me, I've always thought of uh, DevOps and automation as being uh, just a way of automating business rules, right? To me, you know, when I go look at a DevOps pipeline, the business rules are very clear to me, right? It's in code, but it's very clear. And I think that's the benefit of using automation and, um, you know, pipelines, right? Um, it's very clear where, who does what, um, and you have that, those defined, clearly defined roles because it's, 
you know, it's a pipeline. Um, and they recommend uh, mutual authentication uh, very strongly. But of course, that does depend on having a strong um, PKI management internally and, uh, you know, automation associated with your PKI system, which not everyone is there. Uh, this is something, if you haven't explored, again, the CNCF website, I encourage you, they have something called the interactive, uh, the CNCF intera interactive landscape or the cloud native interactive landscape. And this is, I just pulled a screenshot from the cloud native security landscape, but as you can see, there are a lot of tools. Um, a lot of these came up through the CNCF and a lot of, some of these, the open source ones are either in sandbox or incubator state. Uh, and some of the commercial tools that you're, you may know of, like Aqua and um, Sysdig, they have open source versions that you can use if you're not, if your organization isn't all in on containers and they haven't, they don't want to make a huge investment in some of the commercial tools, you can readily start out with, um, like Falco is uh, an open source tool that uh, is contributed by uh, Sysdig, for example. But then you have Open Policy Agent, which is um, uh, open source for now, unless you choose to have the additional uh, elements from Styra that you know, are added on top of that. Uh, I also recommend uh, that you take a look at uh, OWASP has uh, their software component verification standard. And again, remember a container is a package, a software package. And part of that software package is, uh, are the software components that it contains, right? And this is a uh, way of sort of identifying where you are in terms of uh, your component, your own internal processes for verifying open source software components. Um, and it talks about some of the objectives associated with uh, the SCBS. It's related to the ASBS, if you're familiar with some of, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with this, but this is, uh, as, it's just on version one now. I found it, I find it really helpful when OWASP has these great um, maturity models and because then I can take these and I can use them as an architect. And when people say, well, how should we do it? Well, this guy says to do it like this. See, it's OWASP. Um, this is from the NIST uh, document on application container security guide, and it's the tiers of container technology architecture. This is more for um, sort of awareness. Uh, it has a different life cycle than what I would do, but it's more uh, high level in terms of you know, what they want, how they want you to think about it in terms of validation and the process flow. Um, you know, it's good if you want to use something uh, to, because containers are really complicated to explain to non-technical individuals. And when you're trying to explain to them what the threat model or attack surface looks like, I find that I don't just have one diagram, I have five because each one, you, you'll have different audiences and sometimes they don't understand all aspects of it. And especially with either you may, maybe you have legacy software developers or managers who come from a legacy environment and they don't really understand modern DevOps automation. And so you sort of have to pull up to explain it to them. Um, Something to be aware of uh, if you're uh, struggle if you're paying attention to um, s bombs and bombs uh, bill of materials right software bill of materials um, so we all I think we know what those are right it's a formal list of your software ingredients uh, some of their new um, the White House Executive Order one four zero two eight um, is making this required uh, criteria for certain federal information systems, and it's strongly suggesting this be used for every, you know, for in the private industry as well. Um, there are uh, actually now tools that you can use in addition to creating a software bill of materials with um, an SCA, a software composition analysis tool. You can also do that for a container. 
uh, it, there are two tools, uh, SIFT and TURN, and I have those in my references. Uh, and it becomes, if you, if you have kind of a fat container, it gets a little ugly. But if you want to have SBOMs at different places in your life cycle, or you only want the contain, you only want to do it at the container, there are ways to do that now. Um, I <laughs> something I, I'm sharing with you here. I, I do have a blog post about this. Um, it's a concept. Uh, you've heard me talk about decision points and policy engines. I think the thing to to address when you're looking at a container supply chain and when you're thinking about validation, the mistake that I see happen a lot is people try to embed the decisioning in the software supply chain itself. They try to embed a criteria into the uh, pipeline as code. I think that's a terrible idea. And the reason why is, is the same reason that you would not, that if you fail to modularize your code, if you write all your functions and everything in, in the code and you don't you know, uh, break it up into modules, right? That's the same problem that you're having when you're trying to embed that intelligence and decision-making in the uh, pipeline of software itself or software. Um, that's, you get a mess essentially. Um, so what I think when you start looking at opportunities for validation, you want to look at decision points, and then you want to look at ways to have external policy engines that a pipeline can go query for a decision, right? Um, it, by doing that, by having this external engine that you query, like for example, open policy agent, which is a, a policy engine, then you're creating, you're, you're observing separation of duties because then you have a team like a security engineering team that then identifies the policy and writes it. And may, maybe they manage the policy engine, but they don't actually have to touch the plat, the, the, the Jenkins jobs, like the CICD pipeline, they don't have to touch that, that software pipeline, right? And then you've observed separation of duties. Um, and then you can introduce concepts such as slow path and fast path, as, as I talked about earlier. Um, you have uh, an opportunity to really create uh, a very efficient, um, process by doing that. Uh, I have a link to the concept that I've written about. I feel very strongly about how this is supposed to be done. Um, but it's mostly, like I said, to support um, the way new security teams need, need to work. Um, just want to make sure that I didn't miss any. Oh, I did. Uh, so here is, and Ross will recognize this, this was my, um, this was the thing I spent a lot of my time working on um, when I was at Capital One, which is uh, a real use case, real world use case for a, a secure container uh, life cycle, right? Um, and I want to point out, I want to highlight the elements that I think might be helpful uh, to everyone, um, which is that we, we separated it out and we were going to have a policy validation service. Well, we did, um, it was, uh, we used uh, open policy agent. And then we had an image security validation service, right? That would validate that the image passed, you know, what our security criteria was. And then you essentially, uh, the thing that we were implementing was this concept of promotion and distribution that you, the image was validated and then it went to a non-prod environment. It was signed, went to a non-prod environment and it went through different testing and then so that it could go through release management, right? 
then once it went through release management and it got the check, yes, you have passed all the additional criteria, you know, including maybe some functional security testing, et cetera. Once you've passed that, then you get promoted to a production environment. What's important to point out here is that when we promoted uh, the idea, when we were going to promote containers, um, we were going to promote them to read only registry edge nodes, which meant that the CI CD pipeline was only pulling signed, validated images that were. Uh, on read, they were read only. So you couldn't, nobody could interact with those read only edge node uh, container repositories, except through a, going through a promotion process, right? A distribution process that essentially it was a way um, to, to further, you know, isolate the actual production environment of the pipeline so that you couldn't, you wouldn't get rogue images or you wouldn't have people trying to bypass um, the security validation process. So uh, that was uh, one other thing that I added that Ross actually sent this to me. Um, Liz Rice um, in her, one of her, newer uh, container security books from 2020 um, has a container security like threat model. Uh, I have mixed feelings about this because it really emphasizes, you know, the physical machine or a virtual machine. And also it looks at it, the way it looks at it almost is very, um, like you can interact with these different elements to uh, remediate, right? You're not going to patch a badly configured container image or, or interact with it at runtime to fix it, right? You're going to reinstantiate it. I, it takes it, the, the, this sort of threat model uh, diagram takes containers out of the process of building it, which I think the deployment of a container, hence my focus on the supply chain, is really what we need to focus on uh, to secure it. And I think, but I thought it was worth sharing and, and putting in the deck just to make sure that you can see it from both perspectives. So that was a lot of, a lot of talking on my part. <laughs> um, I'll uh, just now, quickly cover, you know, some of the reminders, some of the points that I made um, that small is important and small is beautiful. You want, uh, it's really a best considered a best practice to make your container small. First of all, if your container is small, it starts faster, FYI. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but it also, it, but it's also good to minimize the attack surface by leaving out unnecessary libraries. I've had these conversations lots of times with developers. Like, you have a shell on there for what reason? <laughs> like, you don't need a shell on there. You don't need wget on there. You don't need TCB dump on there. Like, I have seen TCB dump um, and netcat on containers for some reason. Um, who do you trust? Uh, what are your trusted registries? That is something that you can definitively identify in Kubernetes and make it um, your uh, decision, your policy decision that I'm only going to allow images to instantiate or run if they come from a trusted uh, registry. Um, you wanna validate your images and you wanna validate them at multiple places because people could try to go around the enforcement of your supply chain. Uh, your container images do not need to run as privileged. In fact, that is a guaranteed way to own your container host right away. The second you have a privileged container. Now I recognize that security tooling in a lot of cases, there is still some of it that still run, needs to run as privileged, but you can have um, different policies for your administrative or you know containers that need to run 
your daemon sets versus your um, application containers. Don't think that, you know, it, it's everything has to run that way, right? Um, you don't want to put your credentials, keys, or tokens in your image. You want to reduce your listening ports. Again, it increases your attack surface. Um, you want to also, I know this may uh, be obvious, but you want to use a standard runtime. Uh, it's very important to understand that, like, for example, Cryo, um, I'm not sure where the adoption is yet, but it, it, the last time I checked, not all this container security tools supported Cryo. Uh, then um, your container is in a host. It should be considered, you know, very ephemeral and immutable. You want to be able to um, reinstantiate that very quickly. You don't want people logging into it. You don't want uh, containers running for a long time because you could have, there's a potential for drift. Um, so try to, I actually like to see containers have a, t, um, a TTL on them if, anywhere between seven days to two weeks. Um, you only want attested immutable container images to run in your environment. You want to automate the builds and you constantly want to reevaluate your supply chain. I think you should threat model your supply chain, actually. Not many people probably do that, but I think that's a good idea. So that was a lot of talking and knowledge acquisition. Um, I just want to stop and um, check in with people and see. Um, I have a lot of references, <laughs> slides, if you'll see here. I have like four, I think that's a record for me, four slides of references. Um, but I want to check in and, and answer any questions that people have. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, Michelle, it looks like we got one of the questions from Ben in the chat. Uh, is it okay to, to see your slides and make those available? I will be happy to send you a PDF of the slides. It's not a problem. I have a one version of this already up on SlideShare, but um, you know, yeah, I'm happy to. This is a good. I'm I'm hoping you know to share this so that you can use it as a resource, uh, you know, in your organization. I'm happy to do that. Appreciate that. Yeah, I know one of the questions that I, I have is really on the read-only containers. Are you seeing those start to becoming more common across organizations or? I think I, people struggle with that. I, I, um, I would like to see that, but I know that um, there are some containers tool, like I remember people like there being problems with it because apparently the, um, the container would try to write something uh, on the container if you didn't build it right. And I, I'm trying to remember the exact issue. A lot of times it has to do with whether or not you're, you're writing logs to the right, uh, if you're, you're sending logs to, to, I forget what the configuration is for, for logging um, to, to, to the right out socket. And um, there sh you should be able to do it, but it's gonna ta it takes um, a mature development team to be able to build that way. And you are, I think you do hit um, some problems. It may also cause a problem with um, injecting credentials. So you have to, it, it's about testing. I, I see people try to do them and they struggle with them. How's that? Okay. That's what I've seen. Thanks. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I know it, it seems like it shouldn't be too hard to just say, here's a, a steady read-only container so that nobody can modify it. And then you attach a external file system to write your logs to or, or output any data you want to persist and outlive the container. I recall that it had to do with, I thought it had to do with if you were dealing with um, where you injected credentials. Um, that may not be the case anymore, right? 
containers I can barely keep up sometimes with uh, the new techniques that they use, like lazy pulling. I, that came up in a um, at Global AppSec US a couple a few months ago, right when I presented there, and I was watching a talk. I was like, lazy pulling. What the heck is that? I've never seen that before. So, um, and then the idea that I told you about running. Um, I forget what it's called, where the, what the vendor is, but uh, where you run, <laughs> you run Kubernetes on top of Kubernetes, you only let the developers interact with that other Kubernetes with like the one on top of Kubernetes and then the real Kubernetes, the production one, then uh, pulls anything, it, it gets promoted from the Kubernetes on top of Kubernetes, and it gets pulled into the production environment on the, uh, the base one. And I just went, what? <laughs> uh, so essentially, you had, I think the most, the biggest takeaway that I'm hearing, I'm seeing from this is that people are doing a lot of duct taping and workarounds to get the protection mechanisms in place that we used to have with virtual machines. <laughs> and I get it, I, they're, they're wanting the velocity and the um, modularity and the lightness of a container. Personally, I think what's gonna happen is that they're going to add more of the virtual machine hooks and you're going to end up with more things like Firecracker deployed at organizations. It because that makes more sense to me than you know trying to make containers. You know, um, unless you totally uh, decide, unless you ice, you segregate your environments um, into separate clusters, but then you lost the benefit of optimizing your compute. I mean, it, it's, it's a problem. I mean, this is a very challenging problem, I, I think, but is that, sorry, I went off on a tangent there for a second. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, there's just so much cool stuff that we're seeing. Like one example is how people might use Kubernetes to do more of some of that GitOps functionality where they're saying, hey, it doesn't look like it, so change it back, right? And, right. and that's just really powerful concepts or just having the ability to scan your container images so that you know if things are bad, you know, that was a little harder to do in just the virtual machine days. Um, but now that everything can be packaged before going in, that can help. Just some some really interesting concepts, but then also a lot of complexity. So you can also dig your own grave is if you do things incorrectly. Yeah, like everybody talks about using SecComp. Oh, you have to use SecComp, you have to use SecComp. Um, okay, how many developers do you know that actually know all the library, like all the uh, system calls they need to make? <laughs> I can tell you, most of them don't know that, right? And so now you're going to say, "No, we're going to configure SecComp, and we're going to we're going to get this right." And then you know the policies, you know the admission control policies, and they've changed. Uh, I'm the name is escaping me. So they recently changed the way they're doing Kubernetes um, admission control now and policies. Um, trying to find the name. Uh, yeah, I don't have it here. But um, you, I mean, most people use the most primitive and simplest. Um, like a lot of them don't, a lot of people don't even use admission control. A lot of people don't use the policies that you can to the full extent that you can use them some people don't even use probably use namespaces because it's super complex but um i i grow increasingly concerned that the level of complexity to get the security 
that you need, um, most people just aren't using it. It's just too hard. <laughs> That's the thing that I think concerns me the most. Well, Michelle, I just want to thank you for coming to speak to the Nashville OWAS chapter and your experience that you're sharing with all of us on containers. And we'll we'll post this to the YouTube channel so other folks can see it. But uh, you know, it, it's it's always helpful to learn from other folks, and we really appreciate you coming to to speak. Sure, no problem. It was, thank you for having me here and. Uh... It was nice being able to meet uh, people in Nashville and talk about containers and Kubernetes. <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too overwhelming, but I'm happy to share the content. It was a little like, ah, uh, probably dry, so. All right, any other final questions for Michelle? No, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very uh, good. Where would we find the, the um, link to the PDF, would that be on the meetup later? Or? Yeah, normally there's a, a couple of different things. One, everything gets linked to the, uh, let's say prior meetup pages. And, and I believe there's also a wiki page that gets updated too from the Nashville chapter. So okay. we can make sure to send those out. You gotta feed those guys behind you. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a skeleton <laughs> crew. <laughs> I yeah, like that's that. pretty funny. So, well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Thank you, Michelle. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you.